I urged Brianna to be quiet. She was never the type to remain calm when something was clearly going wrong, but what could we do? Masked guys were after us for no reason at ten at night, and we didn't know what to do. Luckily, we found a motel on the way and ran to it before they caught up with us, thanks to Brianna's driving skills when she's scared as well. Who knew going for a secret abortion could end in tears? Our parents thought we were at a sleepover and supposed to be back home the next afternoon, but with the way things were going, we might be dead before they realized that we were already having unprotected sex and were pregnant. Two best friends pregnant at the same time. Birds of the same feather did flock together. Come out, come out wherever you are. A thick voice passed by the door of the room we hid in. The light was off and the door locked, but we both knew it was never enough to keep dangerous men off once they had a plan. Come out now! The same voice said, angrier and thicker. It sounded like he was running out of patience. I looked over at Brianna, who looked like she was going to scream in fear any second. I begged her silently not to. She wouldn't dare to give us away easily. I looked around the room. There was nothing to use in case they found a way in. If they somehow did, we were dead and we both knew it. My best bet was any lucky Samaritan who would help us by finding some weird guys lurking around. We mean no harm. We just want to play a little. I heard another voice, sweeter and calmer one compared to the first. It must be the second guy. His voice sounded oddly familiar, but I pushed it aside. Someone I knew would not just want to hurt me. I never bullied anyone, and I never said things or did things that might make someone want revenge. In a matter of seconds, I thought about my life, the good things I'd done, and how it was possible that all of it was going to end in a second, and those who would remember were my parents, but they'd be too disappointed at me to want to come to my burial. My parents were strong advocates for stand against abortion. A group of people who came together to stop the growing number of young girls who showed up at clinics each day to abort. It was another reason I was going to a different town to have the abortion. No matter how careful I was in my town, my parents would find out, and that defeated the whole plan of keeping it from them. Brianna's situation was worse. Her parents were leaders of a church, and while Brianna made it clear that she wanted nothing to do with it, she still stayed with her parents because it was closer to get to her place of work from their place. Because of that, she had to follow rules that her parents put down, else she was out of their house. Two unlucky girls who were just having fun might become the reason they died. The loud noise that came from the door to the floor of the room made me jump up. The two men were in the room. Mischievous ones and knives in their hands, sharp ones. I held Brianna close as they moved towards us. All said and done, and hoping to see each other whenever we do, if there is a next life. Oh, kids, the guy with the thick voice said. He didn't look like he was older than us, which made me wonder why he called us kids. Think, Jane, think and focus on how to escape, I reminded myself, thinking about his voice was only useless at that particular time. This would have been easy if you just let us in easily. Now we might have to do things we don't want to just to get you to cooperate, the same guy said. The other guy was silent, following closely behind. Okay, let's see how to go about this, he continued with the knife placed on his tongue and positioned in such a way that he meant business and didn't intend to waste any time. Brianna was already in a pool of tears, begging and giving them reasons to spare our lives. She was good at it. If they were not murderers, experienced ones, they'd let us go, but they paid no attention to her sob stories. I didn't know what to say. Nothing I said could change their made-up minds. I only laid there and waited for whatever their next judgment for us was going to be. They were in charge now, and it didn't look like it was going to change. I pulled Brianna closer, motioning her to keep still and not say anything. I knew that we were still alive, meaning killing us wasn't their main goal, and they had something else they wanted to get from us. They didn't mention money or any material things, and this confused me further. They threatened us with words, and stared at us like they were both communicating through invisible means we could not understand. Without thinking of the effect, I stood up and pushed the guy who was doing all the talking, causing his knife to fall. Brianna followed suit and did the same thing to the other guy. Bless her for being wise. 
It was easy. I could not have been expecting it. It was good that we caught them off guard. I picked up one of the knives and Brianna did the same, pointing it at them. Take off your masks now! I yelled. Brianna stood, still shaken by the earlier events, but she took her stand. She knew that showing she was scared could be a weakness they would take advantage of. Now! They were wasting too much time and I needed to get away from them as soon as possible to a place of safety. I was not expecting the face behind the masks. Will and Logan? They looked more surprised than we were. I walked up to Logan and slapped him hard. Harder than I had ever slapped anyone. How could both of our boyfriends be the reason we were running around looking for safety? I didn't bother listening to any explanation they had. So did Brianna. It was a prank! They both yelled as we walked out and got into our car. A useless prank! I held Brianna's hand and assured her everything was okay. They raised her adrenaline level for nothing. All for a useless prank. Too scared to subscribe? <laughs> My fiancé's grandmother died, and Dennis made it clear we needed to be present for her burial. She was Dennis's favorite, and from the descriptions of how his grandmother treated him, he appeared to be her favorite, too. I felt for him during the month when he heard the news of her death. He was withdrawn and depressed. We couldn't go on many dates, and many times I went to his house to comfort him. His mourning state scared me, and made me fall in love with him more. I also hoped he didn't lose anyone else soon. In the week of her burial, we traveled out of town together. The town where she lived was 16 hours from ours. We could have taken the airplane, but Dennis and I had always wanted to go on a long ride together. We decided to leverage the situation and distance for our pleasure. I thought it was a good way to comfort my fiancé, too. We planned to have a stopover by night wherever we reached. The rest of the journey was to continue in the morning. When we finally stopped, the only place in sight where we could lodge was a rundown motel. The irony was the signboard, lit and shining with the name of the motel, Sunlight Motel. Other than the signboard, the state of the motel seemed terrible with a dull entrance and hanging windows. Only the reception was lit. Dennis and I didn't have a choice. We went in. The reception and receptionist calmed our nerves. Maybe they didn't take care of the exterior of the motel, but they certainly spent a lot of time decorating the interior. It was well lit and ventilated. We almost forgot it looked run down from the outside. With Dennis's arms locked with mine, we secured a room and were given the key to room 1134. We pulled our night bag inside and searched for the room. We saw 1120 down to 1133, but when we saw the next room, the tag was Hell. Dennis and I walked along, but the next room after Hell was 1135. We moved back, and only then did we realize the name tag was upside down. We chuckled, turned the tag upward, unlocked the door, and retired inside, tired from the journey so far. Dennis went to the bathroom first, and when he was done, I went too. We ate a light dinner, something I packed in the one-night bag. Fully satisfied, we lay under the sheets, eager to sleep. And that's when the trouble started. The lights flickered. We thought it was an electricity problem. Perhaps the connection, since the motel wasn't in the best condition. I asked Dennis to turn off the lights, and he did. Except, the moment he was in bed again, the lights came on. My heart sped up. I could tell Dennis, too, got scared because he shook in his space and clung to the bedsheets. I stood instead to switch off the lights, but I didn't reach the light switch. Almost like I tripped over something. I toppled to the ground, hitting my head hard. When I looked back, there was nothing. The floor was as bare and smooth as a neatly shaved head. Dennis rushed over to help me. My head was bleeding. We took careful steps to the bed. Dennis called the receptionist for first aid and to get a change of a room, but he said there was none of either. I cleaned my wound in the bathroom and stopped the bleeding with a cloth. After a while, when things seemed a little calm, Dennis went over to switch the light off again. We tried to remove the bulb, but we couldn't. The lights came on by themselves, again. 
We retired from that and decided to sleep covering our faces with the sheets. It worked for a while, and the fear we felt dissolved. But it came back when I tried to touch Dennis and I couldn't. He was right next to me, but the moment I stretched my hands, he was miles away, almost like we weren't in the same bed. Dennis? I called silently under the sheets. He responded. His voice was close to my ear. I reached out to him but couldn't find him. T touch me, I called. I can't reach you. Where are you? He said. And fear gripped me. Chills ran down my spine and we both yanked the sheets off our heads. Dennis was right beside me. But when I tried to touch him even with the light on, he was far. Before I could comment, the light went off. We stayed still in the dark, overcome with fear. I went under the sheet and tried to touch him again. It felt like a human was separating us, preventing us from touching each other. Then, I felt hands on my breasts, fondling them with so much fun. Is that you, Dennis? I asked, relaxing in the feel of what I thought was his touch. Me? What? He asked. And I tried to hold the hands that played with me, but there was nothing. Only space. What's happening? He said, but I couldn't respond. He didn't say anything again. He was snoring within seconds. I jerked the sheets off my head. The room was still dark. And someone spanked my butt. I knew it wasn't Dennis. I wanted to cry, but my mouth was covered and my body was glued to the bed, unable to move. Dennis was right beside me, and I was molested by a ghost all night. All through this, Dennis slept soundly. I could tell because when it was dawn the next day, his face was well rested, and mine was gaunt with fear. I couldn't tell him what had ensued because he was bound to say I'd imagined it. He wasn't one to believe in ghosts. And despite what happened with the light and tripping, I could bet he would blame it on the facilities of the motel. I got dressed faster than he did, and soon we were out of the room finding our way to the reception. I glanced at the tag on the door and realized that it was upside down again. I shivered, glad to be leaving. The receptionist stopped us before we left. Did you have a good night, he said, and winked at me. If Dennis saw it, he didn't react. I was a little hurt. Dennis communicated that we had a fine night, and I nodded in agreement. The receptionist smiled, particularly at me. I shuddered. As Dennis moved out, the receptionist held my shoulder. He then whispered, People never leave with great news when leaving room 1134. Some years ago, a young man was raped by five ladies. He died there in that room. People say that his ghost remains and rapes any lady that sleeps there. I shivered and allowed a smile to remain on my lips. We left the town and arrived at Dennis's grandmother's house safely. The journey left me with a scar and I never slept at a motel again. I never told Dennis the story either. Brad abandoned me. I was wasted and with absolutely no idea where I was. It was Brad's idea to go someplace far for our date. I agreed to go because I trusted him. He was my husband and he deserved it. He promised to drive to and fro. I hated driving. My mistake was forgetting how petty he could be and I should have avoided teasing him at all costs. My drunk self had no control and I badmouthed him more than I could take back. He left in anger. I was uneasy by myself, cold, wasted, and with no idea where I was. It seemed too unsafe for a woman like me to roam the streets or search for a vehicle at the unholy hour of 1am. I settled for the next reasonable option, spending the night at a nearby hotel. I paid mine and Brad's bill as I exited the pub house he brought me to. I tried to act as sober as possible as I walked over to the motel on the other side of the road. What a perfect venue. I would like a room for the night, I said to the tired receptionist at the reception counter. He looked at me with questioning eyes and announced that there weren't any vacant rooms. I couldn't take no for an answer. 
I pressed again, and something that looked like uncertainty flashed through his eyes. There is one room, he said, but no one ever uses it. There is a rumor that people who sleep there will never be normal again. A crazy myth, I thought. The myth reminded me of a story my mother told me when I was younger, about a room in the house that I was never to be found in. My mother narrated that ghosts inhabited the room and if I ever entered or tried to enter, they would chase me for the rest of my life. My mother had stored up alcohol in the room and she didn't want me snooping around it with my siblings. I caught on to the myth in my early teenage years and had a problem trusting myths ever since. They were just made up stories by people who wanted what will please them. I told him to wave off the idea and give me the keys to the room. It would be morning soon anyway and I could return to my house. All I needed was a place to lay my head for the moment. He received the payment and gave me the keys to the room. I staggered upstairs towards the room. It was rusty and smelly on the inside, but that didn't undermine how exquisite it looked. I almost convinced myself that I was in a hotel. What a waste of room if people indeed weren't allowed to use it. The room was furnished with a king-sized bed and numerous fluffy pillows. The pillows were light but smelled of dust. The bathroom was in good condition with a shower and flowing water. The room was lit up with a chandelier in the center and I was convinced that the room had to be a VIP area. Maybe that was the reason the receptionist didn't want me using it. He must have made up the myth to reserve the room for someone else. It felt good that I stood my ground and convinced him to give me the room. It was much better than being found drunk in the middle of nowhere. The bed just like the rest of the room, was full of dust, almost like the cleaners purposely skipped the room every morning. I was too drunk to care, although I wondered what might have made them stop caring for what seemed to be the most expensive room in the motel. I dusted off the bed and climbed into the covers. Safely tucked in, I rested my head on the pillow and drowned in sleep. Except I was woken up a few moments later. With hands raised and scrambling nothing but air, I made stifled screams. I couldn't tell the time because I was unable to open my eyes and mouth, but I felt the pillow in my face, suffocating me. It felt strange because I couldn't feel anybody. It was just the pillow, and I couldn't lift it off my face either. I struggled for what seemed like a million years, and when I surrendered, my eyes shot open. My eyes were greeted by emptiness and darkness. I rose from the bed and checked around the room, the bathroom, the window, and the door lock. It was in place, in order. The experience baffled me, but when I saw that there was nothing out of place in the room, I crawled back into bed and willed my eyes to close. I was barely asleep for five minutes when I felt like I was being flogged by thugs with a million rods. The energy was raging and the intensity made me cry, but my cry was muffled. I felt the pillow suffocating me again. I twisted and turned in bed, rolling in pain. I blinked open my eyes and the room was in the same condition, in order, with nothing out of place. Fear gripped me. I rolled out of the bed and flipped the switch, leaving the light on. I checked around the room for evidence of any movement, but I found none. The receptionist's warning came back to me. People who sleep there will never be normal again. The words of the receptionist replayed in my head over and over and over. I gripped my ears and screamed into the duvet that was on the bed. I shut my eyes and willed myself to sleep, but I didn't. I knew I couldn't. I shivered and rolled beneath the duvet drawing it to my face, begging for morning to come. The morning didn't come. Hands did. I was wide awake and I felt them all over my body clawing at me, tracing their fingernails along my skin. I screamed, but I knew it would be mistaken for the pleasure of orgasm. Motels were always filled with such screams. The suffocation continued, and the rods and the fingering hands. I clung to the duvet like it was my only means of protection. I couldn't stand, couldn't leave, and I regretted following Brad to the pub house. I regretted being his wife and I regretted agreeing to sleep in the isolated room. I longed for morning amidst the screams and torture. The day broke, and morning came eventually. I couldn't check out myself, 
because I didn't come out like a normal person as the receptionist predicted. I was taken to the psychiatric hospital. Later, after six months of treatment, I was finally at home. Although I was far from my older self, I was much better. Once I had settled in, I thought of knowing the backstory of the motel. I searched for its number online and gave them a call. I was told that the owner of the motel used to stay in that room. She was somehow murdered and her murderer was never found. Rumor had it that her ghost tormented anyone who stepped into the room. Perhaps she thought they infiltrated her territory. I never slept in a motel again and I never followed my husband on a far outing.